going to go ahead and get started. My name is Professor Nicole Garnett, and I teach in the law school here at Notre Dame, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today and to introduce our speaker, Professor Philip Bess from the Notre Dame Architecture Department. He's also the Director of Graduate Studies there. Professor Bess joined Notre Dame just this year. We stole him away from Andrews University, which I'm sure was heartbroken. He was an excellent teacher, an award-winning teacher and scholar there for a number of years. He has a Master's in Architecture from the University of Virginia Architecture School, as well as a Master's of Theological Studies from the Harvard Divinity School in Church History. He has written broadly about architecture generally, about urban design. He is a leader in the field in a very important effort to try to integrate Christian and religious principles into new urbanism, the ideas of new urbanism, which as a legal scholar, I think there are two things that new urbanists have not quite caught on to. One is the extent to which the law should shape their thinking about the enterprise, but also they haven't quite caught on to the extent to which religious sensibilities and a deeper moral anthropology has to shape ideas of community. And that is something that Professor Bess has done really wonderful work in and continues to do wonderful work in. He is also, I know, on his CV, an expert on urban baseball stadiums and has written and spoken widely about that. Today he is going to present a paper entitled, The City is Also an Aesthetic Object. We welcome him. Thank you, Nicole. Actually, I'm going to say a little bit about law today. I accepted David Solomon's invitation to speak at this conference several months back and have been thinking about it for quite some time. But David and I are on opposite ends of the campus and rarely see each other, so when I finally touched base with him a couple of weeks ago, I asked him what he would like me to speak about. And his response was pure David. He says, well, I just thought you'd be bubbling over with so many ideas that you would just tell me what you want to talk about. But since you asked me, why don't you talk about the possible intersection of Catholic intellectual culture with the contemporary practices of architecture and town planning, and what the implications of that intersection might be for an architectural curriculum? Well, David was pushing all of my buttons, of course, since much of my time since I've arrived at Notre Dame, since I arrived at Notre Dame last January, has been spent working with Dean Michael Likoudis and the architecture faculty to revise and expand the School of Architecture graduate program. So I've decided to take up David Solomon's challenge, and I'm hoping to finish my talk and get through all 86 of my slides and still have some time left over for some questions. I've found, however, that I'm so bubbling over with wild and gross and no doubt philosophically naive generalizations that I cannot fit them all into my presentation, so I've prepared four full pages of excess contentiousness for general distribution, which are available for you to consider and to do with as you please. At the risk of a reenactment of the famous Marshall McLuhan scene in Annie Hall, I'd like to begin with a reference to Alistair McIntyre's three rival versions of moral inquiry, encyclopedia, genealogy, and tradition. For if there's a general reciprocity between ideas and actions, I want to suggest specifically a reciprocity between our own emotivist cultural environment and the physical and spatial forms of our built environment. I will note also that there are architectural and urban analogs for what, in the realm of moral philosophy, McIntyre calls encyclopedia, genealogy, and tradition, and that in the culture of architecture, these go by the names modernism, postmodernism, and tradition. But by whatever name it goes, I would suggest that both the ordinary, everyday American environment that has come to be known as sprawl and the most celebrated and vilified work of today's most famous architects are simply low and high cultural expressions of our common emotivist culture. Encountering the sheer ugliness and inconvenience of the human settlements we've made during the past 60 years and the literary organs of those who produce them, 
A visitor from an alien planet could only conclude that the contemporary culture of architecture is in disarray and its intellectual discourse deeply incoherent. Ask any architect, and I suspect most would agree at one point or another with any or all of the following propositions. That the city is the community to which architects are morally obligated. That the city is above all a place of ruthless Darwinian economic competition. That architects must be true to our art. That authenticity imposes upon us an obligation to formal innovation that architects have an obligation to celebrate and express difference, that architecture gives physical and spatial form to shared values and existing cultural ideals, that architecture can and should be a force for cultural change, that architects have an obligation to be ecologically responsible and to promote and design durable buildings, that architects working in the cultural context of the modern marketplace can properly disregard durability that architecture is first and foremost about making places for communities, that architecture is primarily a manifestation of power relations, that good architecture and urban design should promote uh, equality and cultural and economic diversity, that culturally authentic architecture can only be created and understood by an elite avant-garde. Architects today somehow manage simultaneously to desire artistic independence and communal belonging a sense of inner-driven artistic vocation and more respect from other professions, equality of opportunity and guaranteed results, regional identity and a global economy, advanced technology and communion with nature, consumer goods and a simpler life, and ideally we want all these things right now. <laughs> now our tragic comic circumstance is not that these are all false ideas or ends unworthy of our desire. Uh, any or all of these goods and propositions may be defensible in the context of some larger framework. It's rather that the framework itself is missing, uh, and there is no consensus in the profession or the schools about how and to what ends these goods and ideas are or should be uh, ordered. There are, however, subordinate intellectual frames of reference within which some of these ideas find uh, their natural home, and it's here that I would like to offer a brief, uh, and in fact way too brief, characterization of modernism, postmodernism, and tradition in contemporary architecture and urbanism that looks not only at their aesthetic characteristics, but also at their respective views of human nature, artistic creation, reason, virtue, authority, and the interrelationship of these uh, to individual human well-being. For most of the first um, two-thirds of the 20th century, modernism in architecture was on the intellectual ascent. And even today, it remains the default setting of most architectural practice. But here it's necessary to distinguish between modernism as an ideology and modernism as a style. Modernism as a formal activity, um, one is uh, almost tempted to go so far as to call it the modernist tradition. Uh, is an aesthetic pursuit in which many very talented architects are engaged to this very day. But modernism as an ideology, an ideology that at a certain moment in history gave birth to modernist style, is something to which few contemporary architects would give intellectual assent, though modernism remains, uh, retains much force uh, as a cultural habit of mind. What are some of the features of modernist ideology and its accompanying aesthetic? Colin Rowe has aptly described modernism as a gospel. Modernism was utopian, and arguing that authentic architecture necessarily reflects the spirit of the age, modernist architects strove to invent an architecture appropriate to their machine age era. In addition to their advocacy of industrial materials and methods of construction, modernists argued for a peculiarly modern uh, aesthetic characterized by non-hierarchical, free-flowing space and figural objects, structural honesty, unadorned ideal form, and functional rationality. Its aesthetic preferences were for ideal platonic forms and abstraction. Its view of history was progressive, of nature romantic, of human nature malleable and perfectible. Human well-being was conceived in terms of health and hygiene the virtues of the home and office in terms of efficiency. Modernism's superior character type was the avant-garde artist, 
not religious, but spiritual, a confluence of noble savage and tragic hero. One senses from the modernist literature of the 1920s and its progeny to this day that artists are willful, but the masses are not, that most human beings are objects rather than subjects. In the modernist view, rationality is timeless and objective, and it is the zeitgeist that establishes authority for architectural symbolism, however mysteriously and in ways that only the avant-garde can discern. And indeed, it is the zeitgeist that architecture itself is most obliged to symbolize. Modernism's view of tradition and history is that both are irrelevant to contemporary life. So it's perhaps no coincidence that modern urbanism is known in both theory and reality uh, for its support for so-called urban renewal, the demolition of large blocks of city neighborhoods in order to create a tabula rasa for modernist building projects. And although, mo and uh, although architectural modernism as both practice and ideology didn't really take off until about 1920, it's not hard to recognize its affinities with at least some important strains and themes of modern Enlightenment rationalism. Um, modernist architecture became somewhat a victim of its own success uh, as it was transformed over a generation or two from a European ideology of revolution to a symbol of American corporate capitalism. Nevertheless, modernist architecture continues to be built today by practitioners whose interests are more aesthetic than ideological, resulting in high-profile projects that I am here characterizing somewhat casually rather than jealously as Baroque modernism, um, such as this twisting tower by Santiago Calatrava currently under construction in Sweden. Um, thus would I also characterize as Baroque modernism the new Los Angeles Cathedral by Rafael Mineo, as well as the new Church of the Year 2000 in Rome by Richard Meyer. Whether Frank Gehry's uh, Bilbao Guggenheim Museum uh, is an example of Baroque modernism or postmodernism seems to me somewhat ambiguous, since Gehry's work is not particularly taken or particularly laden with theory unlike, for example, the work of Zaha Hadid. Regardless, modernism as an architectural ideology has been under, under intellectual siege for nearly 40 years, ever since the publication in 1966 of Robert Venturi's gentle manifesto, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, uh, and since, and in, in the early 70s, uh, the, the writings of Colin Rowe that culminated in the 1978 publication uh, of Collage City, uh, co-authored with Fred Coder. Venturi's book in particular was the opening salvo in what became a large-scale assault upon establishment modernism by a loose movement that came to be characterized as architectural postmodernism. But it was Collage City that presented what remains arguably the most devastating intellectual critique of modernist ideology to come from within the culture of architecture especially in the early days of the architectural wars of the 70s and 80s, where modernism promoted purity of form, postmodernists promoted formal complexity. Where modernism promoted buildings as isolated objects, postmodernists promoted buildings as parts of a larger physical and social uh, context. Where modernists were doctrinal in their rejection of ornament and decoration, postmodernists were aggressively, if somewhat superficially, ornamentalist. Where modernist architecture was in conception, rhetoric, and appearance, discontinuous with architectural history, um, though not really uh, in as much as uh, all the early modernists had been educated as traditionalists. Um, but whereas um, the, the modernists rejected history, the early postmodernists were relentless in their references to architectural history. Where modernism was utopian, postmodernists eschewed a single meta-narrative, uh, adopting instead an attitude of irony often expressed through the juxtaposition of caricatured elements of traditional architecture with standard modern construction. Uh, both modernist and postmodernist buildings were then and continue to be characterized by a high degree of abstraction and a curious but palpable disinterest in durability and material reality. Uh, it is widely understood, for example, that the crucial moment in the life of any avant-garde building is when it is completed and photographed. Uh, it matters not if shortly thereafter the building starts to fall apart. 
but where ideological modernists tended to Platonist affinities, uh, minimizing and abstracting building forms to better approximate their formal essence. Postmodernists tend to be Gnostics, uh, appearing initially to devalue actual buildings in favor of their meaning, but more recently in favor of their meanings, uh, plural. One of the most articulate and readable postmodernist critics, Jeffrey Kipnis, has written about postmodernist architect Peter Eisenman that Eisenman's work in the late 1980s became increasingly directed toward, quote, design which no longer seeks to embody any specific meaning, architectural or non-architectural, but rather to create a formal and material environment capable of engendering many meanings, end quote. What another prominent postmodernist architect theorist Bernard Schumi has characterized as, quote, an architecture of the signifier rather than the signified, end quote. Where modernism represented a kind of faith, postmodernism is suspicious. Schumi, again, has said of modernist architectural historiography that it is, quote, linear and hierarchical and wants to emphasize dominant structures, but these are now discredited forms of architectural analysis, end quote. Finally, although it has become commonly understood among postmodernists that there is no zeitgeist, uh, they nevertheless persist in behaving as if somehow it remains their duty as artists to represent the spirit of the age in their buildings. The practical effect of this has been to make novelty virtually the sole criterion for what constitutes authentic architecture, uh, an, attitude, an attitude embodied uh, paradigmatically for some 15 years now in the architecture criticism of the New York Times and prominently on display in the recent World Trade Center site competition. Um, this is the winning entry uh, by Daniel Liebeskind uh, for the site of, of the World Trade Center, uh, though virtually nothing of what is shown here will be included uh, in the completed project. And uh, here is another uh, postmodernist uh, competition entry, this by uh, United Architects. We now perhaps can see some emerging themes in postmodernist, uh, in postmodern architecture and theory, reminiscent of certain themes identified by McIntyre in Nietzsche's The Genealogy of Morals. The indeterminacy and elusiveness of architectural meaning, the architect as ironic gamesman and aesthete, architecture as a symbol of power, rationality as a mask for the will to power, architecture as both play and politics, novelty as the measure of both personal and architectural authenticity, the city as that cornucopia of economic, aesthetic, and sexual options for individuals pursuing their private agendas, shared notions of beauty, of architecture as a symbol of a just and civil society, or of memory and hope, um, are simply outside of the postmodernist architectural discourse though it is of interest that the postmodernists in the World Trade Center competition resorted to that discourse in describing their proposed buildings. And if I may posit that architecture does indeed always symbolize power, but also aspires uh, to symbolize legitimate authority, where modernist architecture sought to symbolize and anticipate an imminent techno-rationalist utopia, postmodernist architecture seeks to symbolize a therapeutic culture in which everyone is, in the portentous words of Philip Reif, quote, free to live an experimental life, end quote. Now, in describing the trajectory of postmodernist theory from the late 70s to the present day, you perhaps will have noticed that I mentioned but have subsequently dropped the subject of architectural history and its significance. This is because the widespread rehabilitation of architectural history as both intellectually respectable and germane to architectural and urban design was short-lived in American architectural education limited largely to the 70s and 80s. What happened next was, if I may say, the backlash of the modernists. The late 70s and the 80s were a period of enormous ferment in the academic culture of architecture, a time when history was taken seriously and where various positions were explored and debated in architecture schools across the country. And what happened starting in about the late 1980s was that many who began to explore traditional architecture as an intellectual exercise in the early 1980s, uh, including many current senior members of the Notre Dame architecture faculty, began to engage traditional architecture seriously as a vocation. Thus, by the late 1980s, we can see taking shape certain institutional trends that persist to this day. Uh, Thomas Gordon Smith had begun to shift Notre Dame's architectural curriculum in an explicitly classical direction. 
and Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg had staked out an academic beachfront at the University of Miami as the base of operations for their neo-traditional uh, architecture and town planning practice that in the early 1990s emerged nationally as new urbanism. But with the exception of the program that began to take shape in the late 1990s at Andrews University up the road in Berrien Springs, Notre Dame and Miami represent almost the full extent of the influence of traditional architecture and urbanism in today's academic culture of architecture, or at least in architecture schools. The overwhelming majority of both North American and European uh, architecture schools witnessed a curricular retrenchment dominated by neo-modernist aesthetics and postmodernist critical theory to the point where in the overwhelming majority of architecture schools uh, today, architectural history, if it is taught at all, is completely divorced from the design studio. And the design studios themselves are virtually without exception conducted upon modernist or postmodernist intellectual and aesthetic premises. Now, traditionalist architects and urban designers today are therefore a small minority uh, within the larger culture of architecture, though for all that not necessarily lacking uh, in clients. Um, and here I show, and unfortunately it's not, the smaller text doesn't seem to be readable, but here I show the Steve Peterson Barbara Littenberg World Trade Center competition entry, the only traditional urban proposal of the seven submitted. Uh, f uh, in return for skillfully proposing both a memorial and the reassemblage of Lower Manhattan's network of streets and blocks, this proposal was quickly dismissed by the New York Times architecture critic as nostalgic and retardataire. Um, it doesn't help that virtually all of us who are traditionalists have as our academic and intellectual background the culture of modernism. Though our intentions have become traditional, many of our intellectual habits remain modernist and so we struggle to locate our arguments on behalf of traditional architecture and urbanism upon solid intellectual, cultural, and anthropological ground. We recognize that we differ from both modernists and postmodernists in our aesthetic preferences, but not always that we may differ also in our understanding of both human nature and artistic creation, that human beings are willful, that we are simultaneously flawed and capable of great good, that we can have true knowledge of the world and make genuine distinctions between right and wrong, between what is beautiful and noble and what is ugly and sordid, that uh, we both remember and hope, uh, and that both memory and hope are crucial components of the creative artistic act, that we are shaped by both nature and history, uh, that we are a self, even if that self is not yet everything that it will ultimately be, and that architecture and the city are the stages whereon it is in our nature to pursue our individual and collective good. We sense that traditional built environments presuppose a different kind of cultural and intellectual environment than most of us inhabit, but we have difficulty making a coherent intellectual argument on behalf of the reasonableness of tradition. Fortunately, however, Alistair McIntyre has already made such an argument uh, in three rival versions, uh, I believe in chapter five, and I've included uh, a pertinent passage in the handout um, that I gave to you. Um, and in describing the rationality and authority of tradition, and in distinguishing these from both the encyclopedist's and the genealogist's view of the same, McIntyre also justifies the study of history. McIntyre's is, of course, a very different view of reason and authority, history and tradition, than we find in either modernism or postmodernism. Um, to go along with the traditionalist different views of architecture and urbanism. It perhaps also suggests for traditionalists a different architectural, architectural, architectural character ideal, not the Sisyphean tragic hero of modernism or the ironic gamesman of postmodernism, but rather the artist citizen, the knight of faith, the comic hero, Don Quixote, Gabriel Syme, for whom the measure of success is the good, whether achieved in one's own lifetime or not. Now, it's a subject of debate among both traditional architects and new urbanists whether the Aristotelian Thomist virtue ethics and natural law tradition from which McIntyre makes his argument on behalf of both the rationality and the dynamism of traditional authority um, is, in fact, essential to traditional architectural and urban practice. Um, I cannot here resolve that debate. But since this intellectual tradition is itself the central Catholic intellectual tradition, 
What I can do is take up David Solomon's challenge to consider the Catholic intellectual tradition and some of its possible applications to and implications for the culture of architecture. A series of 13 propositions about nature, human nature, cities, and artistic creation from within that intellectual tradition um, is included in the handout. And what I'd like to do now uh, is talk about reestablishing a culture of good traditional architecture and urbanism, beginning with considerations of natural law and zoning law, and then moving to architectural education. Uh, but first, I need to show three diagrams from the pen of Leon Creer. The first illustrates the essential formal components of the mixed-use traditional town or neighborhood. A public realm of singular foreground monuments and civic buildings, shown in the diagram on the top. Um, a private realm of commercial and residential background buildings that form a network of blocks, streets, plazas, and squares, shown in the middle. That when combined together, constitute the formal order of the traditional city, as shown on the bottom. The second diagram illustrates seven historic city centers, all drawn at the same scale, all with a superimposed one-quarter mile radius circle. Uh, the most famous of them would be Florence on the lower right, and Venice on the lower left, Amsterdam lower center. Dresden, upper right, Berlin, upper left. The half mile diameter represents the distance that most human beings can comfortably walk in 10 minutes. The measure of good traditional urbanism is how much of one's daily activities can be located within a 10 minute walk. And then the third diagram likens a city to a pizza on the left and likens a neighborhood to a slice of pizza. The slice of pizza possesses all the, essential, all the essential ingredients of the larger pizza. The neighborhood possesses all the essential activities of the larger city. In contrast, suburban sprawl, because it separates uses from each other, is analogous to separating all the ingredients of the pizza from each other, as shown uh, on the right. The ingredients of the pizza are present, but lacking the form of the pizza, there is no pizza. Okay, on to natural law. This slide summarizes and illustrates Thomas's arguments about the relationship between God's eternal law and man-made positive law. The eternal law is manifested as natural law, knowable to everyone through reason alone, and as divine law, knowable to everyone by revelation. And both the natural law and the divine law may be mediators by means of which man-made positive law participates, as St. Thomas says, in the eternal law. Now, if you look under the heading of natural law, you'll see that there are three subcategories, primary precepts, immediate precepts, and common precepts. Primary precepts of the natural law, such as good should be pursued and evil avoided, and harm no one gratuitously, are axiomatic, the foundational principles from which all other natural law precepts derive. Immediate precepts of the natural law, such as render impartially what is due to every person, do not take innocent human life, honor marriage and don't commit adultery, care for children and the elderly, keep promises, don't steal, be courageous, treat others as you yourself would wish to be treated, etc. Um, these are derived from the primary precepts more or less by direct inference. Common precepts of the natural law are more remote from the primary precepts and may be considered as a more detailed kind of immediate precept, but common precepts differ from the primary and immediate precepts in that there may be exceptions to them and because they may not be so widely known or immediately evident as primary and immediate precepts. As an example of a common natural law precept, I offer the principle of subsidiarity. What is of interest for us here is that although subsidiarity is implicit in much of the Catholic intellectual tradition, it was not widely recognized and articulated as a natural law precept until the first third of the 20th century. 
Moreover, the historic circumstances of the articulation of the, articulation of the principle of subsidiary, subsidiarity are quite precise. It was occasioned by the rise of the totalitarian state, prior to which uh, the articulation of the principle had not been necessary. I want to nominate the following as a natural law precept of human placemaking. And it goes like this. Human beings should make walkable mixed-use human settlements. I'll repeat that. Human beings should make walkable mixed-use human settlements. And further, um, I want to suggest that the moral authority of this natural law precept that I've, that I've nominated as a natural law precept is exactly analogous to the moral authority of the principle of subsidiarity insofar as post-World War II sprawl has prompted articulation of this heretofore implicit natural law principle in a manner similar to the way that totalitarianism required articulation of the previously implicit principle of subsidiarity. Let's consider what sprawl is and why it is problematic. Sprawl is the practice of making human settlements characterized by the strict separation of daily human activities. Um, here are some typical examples of what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, here's a monofunctional zone of housing. Think the ingredients of the pizza. Separate. Um, here is a, a monofunctional zone of shopping. A monofunctional zone of offices. Uh, a monofunctional zone for a civic institution, in this case, a public high school. And then this is the kind of uh, uh, street network that we have created uh, because it's necessary to get from these different zones. Uh, it's necessary to drive a car. Uh, you can't, uh, none of these uh, isolated zones are, uh, these, uh, these zones that have been separated from each other are within walking distance. And this is the kind of um, of, of automobile landscape um, that we've created. And uh, again, it's a very, it's maybe a dramatic example, but it's not at all uncommon. And you can see uh, in the image that uh, all of the businesses are uh, oriented to the automobile. There are no sidewalks. Uh, there are no pedestrians except for one forlorn soul in the very center, median uh, at the center of the picture, who, um, who is perhaps near death uh, or, or, or was. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll let you ponder that for a little bit. Um, unknown prior to 1945 and the post-war proliferation of the automobile, sprawl is today typically the only form of development in America legally permitted as of right, meaning legally permitted without procurement of a typically costly and time-consuming variance. Beyond its legal establishment, however, sprawl has become a cultural habit uh, that finds expression not only in positive law zoning ordinances, but also in the mental habits and building practices of virtually every institution having anything to do with the creation of the built environment, from developers, planning departments, banks, governmental housing and financing agencies, schools of architecture and planning, the real estate industry, traffic engineers, advertising agencies, and even the church development bureaucracies of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. If you look at virtually any agent of human settlement, you will find that its foundational conception of the good life in America, even in cities, is suburban. And suburban today means sprawl. Now, the specific task undertaken by the Congress for New Urbanism is the revival and creation of traditional towns and neighborhoods in a physical context of sprawl and the legal and cultural context that promotes it. One of the tools increasingly employed by new urbanists um, is an idea called the transect, uh, borrowed and adapted from ecologists uh, and put forward by new urbanists not only as a tool, but also as the discovery and articulation of a general principle of both land use and historic human settlement. The transect diagram depicts six distinct transect zones, T1 through T6 shown in two different diagrammatic versions for you. Um, zones T1 and T2 refer to rural transect zones in the most general way. 
insofar as the rural zones relate to the development of human habitat. The urban transect, strictly speaking, is described by zones T3 through T6. The transect seeks and purports to describe the general conditions of good human settlements and, like many natural law precepts, can be used as the basis, in this case, for locally particular zoning law. The urban transect may be defined as follows. The urban transect refers to that range of human habitats that support human flourishing, within which human settlements are part of a sustainable um, ecosystem. These habitats, diagrammatically depicted as transect zones, or T zones, range from the least dense human settlements to the most dense human settlements. But each urban T zone denotes a walkable and mixed use human environment wherein within each urban zone, many if not most of the necessities and activities of daily life are within a five to 10 minute walk for persons of all ages and economic classes. Well, no, it's that, I mean, the idea is that, no, uh, it's, it's, it's that, it's that if you're in, like, if you're in a T3 zone, uh, you, you, uh, you are, you are not more than five minutes away from, you know, many things you need to do in your everyday life, even if you go into another zone to do it. So it's not, it's not that you've got zone, 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 but they, uh, the zones themselves aren't in half mile increments. Um, it's, so. Um, what are the transect zones and what do they look like? Um, what they look like will vary from place to place and region to region. But for purposes of human settlement patterns, uh, the idea of the rural preserve T1 zone, um, shown here, um, is that it represents land that will never be subject to development as human habitat. T1 zones would include those portions of the natural world where it's impossible for human beings to build but also those are areas where human beings could build but have definitively decided not to. Examples of the latter would include wilderness preserves, agricultural land that's been placed in trusts precluding development, uh, and even large urban parks. Illustrated here is Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park on the northwestern edge of Michigan's Lower Peninsula. The village of Empire is on the right side of the image. Everything above, to the left of, and below the village should be considered or could be considered as zone T1 rural preserve. Rural reserve T2 land may be visually indistinguishable from rural preserve T1 land. But the idea of the rural reserve T2 zone is that it represents undeveloped land that may or may not eventually be developed. In other words, its future as natural or agricultural landscape is in question and subject to political determination. The implication of this is that all land currently zoned as T2 rural reserve will eventually be designated as either T1 rural preserve or become designated as one or more of the urban transect zones T3 through T6. Illustrated here is a Midwestern farm town that is surrounded by agricultural land unless and until such time as this, as this surrounding farmland has been declared off limits for development as human habitat, its proper transect zone designation is T2 Rural Reserve. With the suburban T3 zone, we are at the least dense end of the urban transect gradation. The general characteristic of the T3 zone is that it allows for relatively low density human habitat detached houses of various sizes typically set back from street front property lines that nevertheless exists within a pedestrian friendly environment and within a five to ten minute quarter mile to half mile walk to a variety of daily life activities. Does that, is that clearer? Um, such as would be common in a traditional village uh, or in a low density traditional urban neighborhood. The actual land use density of the suburban T3 zone may in fact be no different than the density of a sprawl residential subdivision. The difference between them is that the T3 zone is a mixed use and walkable environment, whereas the sprawl subdivision is not. Here are examples of suburban T3 zones, of suburban T3 zone environments in both small towns and a big city. The upper left is Cooperstown, New York, 
The two images to the right are in Skinny Atlas, New York. The lower left is in New Orleans. And, and believe it or not, beyond those trees, there actually are houses. Um, please note how in the Cooperstown image uh, in the upper left, uh, the houses in the foreground of the image are set back from the street, whereas the houses in the background of the image are set close to the street. This is the point of interface in Cooperstown between the lowest density T3 and the next higher density T4 zones. Um, the urban general T4 zone represents the next most dense type of urban land use. As shown in the top diagram, buildings may be attached or detached, but the density remains fairly low. And though a mix of uses is permitted, the non-sacred and non-civic building types in the T4 zone are commonly intended to be primarily residential. Nevertheless, as in every urban T zone, the environment is walkable and within pedestrian proximity of a variety of daily activities. Now, illustrated here are examples of urban general T4 zones in both pre-modern European and modern American towns and city neighborhoods, showing blocks of both single-family and multi-family attached and detached buildings, some of which may legally shelter non- or extra-residential activities. The upper left is in Bruges, Belgium. The upper right in Nantucket, Massachusetts. The lower right is in Chicago. And the lower left is in Cooperstown. The urban center T5 zone represents the next most dense type of urban land use, uh, and again may be found in both small towns and large cities. Here, unlike the T4 zone building types in which alternative uses are permitted but not presumed, T5 buildings are more often attached rather than detached and are of a type presumed and designed to accommodate different uses within the same building most commonly residential or commercial uses located above ground floor retail activity. Illustrated here are examples of urban center T5 zones, again in both pre-modern European and modern American towns and cities. Upper left is the main street in the Italian hill town of San Gimignano. Upper right is Lincoln Avenue in Mr. Bess's neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, to the lower right is Royal Street in the French Quarter in New Orleans and lower left is the short one block main street of the small river town of Ripley, Ohio. The final and most dense transect zone is the urban core T6 zone, which differs essentially from T5 zones only in terms of T6's higher densities of population and activities. There is debate among new urbanists about whether it is proper to characterize T6 densities as applicable to small towns. I think uh, that it is not proper to do so. The kinds of densities characteristic of urban core T6 zones are such that they're really uh, only typical of large cities. And new urbanists really have not yet addressed the issue of whether there are human settlements, in fact, too dense to support human flourishing, and hence be excluded from the dense end of the urban transect. Nevertheless, the examples new urbanists have in mind when we think of T6 zones are unquestionably some of the finest and most hospitable human habitats in the world. These are examples of urban core T6 zones in both European and American cities. To the upper left is the Campo dei Fiori in Rome. Upper right uh, is the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Lower right is Regent Street in London. And lower left is Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. Now, although diagrams of the transect illustrate it as a gradation according to density, it is a mistake to assume that the transect implies such exact sequential gradations in actual cities. Transect zones of very different densities are sometimes juxtaposed to one another to great effect, and transect-based zoning allows for such juxtapositions. For example, illustrated here, are the first and 18th fairways of the old course at St. Andrews, Scotland, with the town of St. Andrews hard up against the edge of the golf course. Researching this is really a drag, I have to tell you. Um, an example of a T1 rural preserve zone, the old course, immediately adjacent to a T5 urban center, the town of St. Andrews. Um, and an even more dramatic example, of course, occurs in New York City, uh, with the juxtaposition of the rural preserve T1 zone of Central Park uh, 
immediately adjacent to the T6 zone of mid and uptown Manhattan. Um, this is a drawing. Uh, the drawing on the left is a drawing of a master plan uh, for a project um, that I did a couple of years ago um, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And the drawings to the right, the three drawings to the right, are perspective views of various conditions that we propose um, within that master plan. Just wanted to set that up for you. Now, let me briefly say something about how the transect serves as a basis for positive zoning law. For any particular new urbanist town or neighborhood proposal, there are typically four kinds of interrelated legal documents that new urbanists propose as alternatives to zoning ordinances that mandate sprawl. These are, in descending order of importance, first, a master plan, um, second, a regulating or land use plan, third, an urban code, uh, which is visual, is graphic, and fourth, a traditional neighborhood district ordinance, which is typically a written document, much, much smaller and more readable than your typical zoning document. I will say, uh, and three of which are depicted um, in uh, the following three slides. Um, uh, and I and we can I'm I'm going to go through this real quick, so we can talk about this at greater length during Q and A uh, if anyone's interested. But um, this is a partial illustration of master plan drawings um, here on the screen. This is an illustration of a regulating plan, and the different colors uh, designate different T zones. Um, so it's a, it's a uh, it's it's similar to a, a you know colored zoning map except that the zoning isn't based on use the zoning is based on uh, on the transect. And then this is uh, a page from an urban code, uh, and this is another page from the same urban code. Now, however necessary it is to discard existing use-based zoning ordinances and replace them with transect-based zoning ordinances. Merely changing the law is not a sufficient condition for good architecture and urbanism. Architecture and urbanism are arts, and good architecture and urbanism requires not only legal support, but also cultural support. It also requires good architects and good urban designers. The cultural support is a responsibility we all share, but educating good architects and good urban designers who are also good citizens is a primary responsibility and objective that I share with my colleagues at the Notre Dame School of Architecture. I mentioned earlier that um, one of the tasks I've been working on with several colleagues is the expansion of the graduate program. And one objective in particular is to make a traditional architectural education available to persons with undergraduate degrees in fields other than architecture. Toward that end, we've recently produced this new poster to advertise the expanded graduate program. Uh, posters are inherently ephemeral things um, of more effectiveness or less, but I share this one with you as a starting point for um, publicly thinking aloud uh, about what one academic architectural program conceived, if not more or less grounded, in the Catholic intellectual tradition might look like. I say more or less because although there is much greater consensus about the, the substance and purposes of architectural education at Notre Dame uh, than almost anywhere else, um, there are still, um, shocking as this will be to many of you, um, differences of opinion and ongoing conversation among the architecture faculty about whether and to what extent we in fact are and wish to be grounded in the Catholic intellectual tradition. The poster advertises in large print graduate study in architecture and urbanism at Notre Dame against the large background of an anonymous but nevertheless iconic image of a traditional and more specifically a classical urban building. In its details, the poster illustrates two representative graduate student projects that illustrate the program's focus upon classical and traditional architecture and urban design. Smaller text provides more specific information about the programs offered, their focus and intellectual premises, the kind of applicant that we are hoping to attract, and where to get further information if interested in applying. Um, and so we see here uh, in the upper right, it says that the graduate curriculum uh, promotes a design that is classical in spirit and form, uh, is based on and extends the best traditions of architecture and urbanism, 
gives place-specific physical expression and supports uh, good human communities. Challenges in response to the exigencies of contemporary practice is environmentally sustainable, is intellectually coherent, is beautiful. And then it indicates uh, the two different degrees we offer, the professional Master of Architecture degree and the post-professional Master of Architectural Design and Urbanism, which we call the Mad About You degree. Um, and uh, indicates also uh, that there are concentrations offered uh, in both classical architecture or traditional uh, urban design. And then on the other uh, lower left, uh, another little bit of text um, that indicates that uh, all students will spend one semester in Rome, uh, that the program is small, uh, that the application process is competitive, uh, and that the scholarships and stipends offered are generous. And then there's this sentence, the graduate program welcomes applications from all persons who meet the entrance requirements and are willing to critically engage the professional and intellectual premises of the program's emphases in traditional architecture and urbanism. And the two key words, as far as I'm concerned, are critically engage. Now, um, further in the background, um, in the upper left and lower right corners of the poster, in alphabetical order, is a by no means uh, exhaustive list of persons and buildings and towns and cities that altogether comprise what Philip Reef might have called our fellow teachers uh, in, the, in this living intellectual and artistic tradition within which the faculty works and into which we are inviting aspiring architects and urban designers to be initiated. What is the intellectual as distinguished from the technical substance of their course of study? In addition to character ideals embodied well or poorly by individual faculty members, the curriculum offers students an initiation into traditional architecture and urbanism by means of type and model. Um, and I have colleagues here, and they may correct me uh, when this is all over about my you know, uh, uh, imprecise use of words, but I'll look forward to that. Uh, specifically, Specifically, it entails an introduction to the nature and purpose of cities and a consideration of urban formal order in terms of urban, spatial, and building types. Uh, and then a consideration of architecture in terms of exemplary models that represent and embody standards of excellence within the practice of traditional architecture. Standards of excellence in reference to which the student is first required to become competent, but ultimately challenged to achieve and perhaps surpass in the course of their life as an architect. What do I mean by urban, spatial, and building types? And what and who uh, are some of our exemplary architectural and urban models and teachers? A major premise of our curriculum is that human beings require good communities in order to flourish, and that cities exist to promote human flourishing. Cities are the physical and spatial forms of community and can be understood formally in terms of certain spatial and building types spatially as plazas, squares, boulevards, avenues, streets, and alleys, and uh, buildings in terms of background urban buildings and foreground urban buildings. Um, and you see here uh, uh, an urban, the, the plaza as an urban spatial type, and four examples of plazas uh, clockwise from top left in Bruges, in Pienza, in Todi, um, and in Florence. Um, the square as an urban spatial type, um, clockwise from top left, Paris, uh, New Orleans, London, and Boston. Um, major difference being one, the, the, the plaza is a hard surface uh, centralized public space, and the square is a planted centralized public space. Um, the boulevard is an urban spatial type. Um, different views of Commonwealth Avenue, misnamed by type, um, but a boulevard, maybe the most beautiful boulevard uh, in the United States in Boston. The avenue is an urban spatial type, uh, with examples, uh, uh, again, clockwise from upper left, from Woodstock, Vermont, from Cooperstown, New York, uh, and from uh, Mr. Bess's neighborhood in Chicago. Um, the street. Uh, as an urban spatial type. Uh, if you're thinking of, uh, I'm sort of doing this as a hierarchy of spaces in descending order, um, so that a street uh, generally handles, uh, it, it's not, it, it handles less traffic than avenues and boulevards are required uh, to handle, but uh, uh, shares its characteristic as, as a linear space. And so, again, streets from the upper left, from Bruges, from Charleston, from Nantucket, and from Chicago. Um, 
And then the alley is sort of the, the bottom of the list, uh, a tertiary space, a service space. It's where garbage gets picked up. It's where utilities are located. It allows you to park street, park cars on, the, uh, on uninterrupted curbs uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the streets. So those are the basic spatial types. Now, when we start looking at, uh, at building types, again, um, uh, roughly, and there's, there's, you, you can make more gradations of this, but, but essentially, um, you, can, you can look at buildings roughly as being urban buildings as being background buildings or, or foreground buildings. Um, and again, if you think of the Leon Creer diagram, all the sort of anonymous squares were the background buildings, and all of the, all of the singular uh, civic buildings and the towers and the monuments, those were all the foreground. Foreground buildings. So, what are the you know what are some of the, the background building types? There's you know flex buildings here, the uh, the kind of building you, you find in T5 where you've got a mix of uses in in the building. Uh, but then just residences, um, uh, single family houses, uh, all examples here of, of urban background buildings of single family houses. Uh, more single family houses. Um, the others were single-family detached houses. These are single-family uh, attached houses, um, row houses. Um, multi-family houses as background buildings. Um, multi-family uh, apartment buildings as background buildings. What's interesting about this uh, in particular, if you'll notice that the building immediately to the right of the larger um, multi-apartment building uh, is a two-flat. Uh, in suburbia, you don't get different uh, housing types located uh, adjacent to each other uh, in cities. In cities, you do, and what makes it work is the um, the, the quality of the street life, the quality of, of streets um, in cities that allows that mix of classes. Um, and then uh, those are all background buildings. So the other the other example of urban building types are the foreground buildings. Um, and again, typically these are the more monumental. Uh, civic and religious buildings. So here are uh, two foreground buildings uh, with churches that are terminating axial vistas. Um, uh, examples of three different uh, town halls uh, in Europe uh, fronting uh, public plazas. Um, uh, examples clockwise uh, uh, from the lower left uh, of uh, an opera house, uh, a, uh, an elementary school, a baseball park, Old Shide Park in Philadelphia, uh, and on the lower right, the Boston Public Library by McKim, Mead, and White in Boston. Again, examples of urban um, foreground buildings. Now, um, when urban foreground buildings, or I say urban foreground buildings represent a sort of bridge uh, to the architectural studio uh, in the school, insofar as foreground buildings are generally the kinds of religious and civic buildings that are a community's most significant structures. Um, as well as those commissions most favored by architects, most desired by architects, because of the greater attention they require, uh, the greater aesthetic attention that they require, and also the larger budgets that they typically receive. Um, and even though architecture and urbanism are inextricably linked, when we get to the design of foreground buildings, we look not only at types, but also at models of excellence, as exemplified by specific buildings and the corpus of specific um, architects. Um, and uh, the ones I'm going to show you, it's by no means exhaustive. Uh, it, it, would, you know, it would be really controversial. Uh, everybody would have their own um, different list. But um, these are examples that I think would, uh, I think most of my colleagues, I, I would hope at the architecture school would agree that these are kind of canonical buildings that, that any student of classical architecture needs to know. So on the lower left, you've got the Colosseum. And going clockwise, you've got the Arch of Constantine. You've got the Pantheon, the Tempietto. Um, here uh, is uh, Michelangelo's um, uh, the Campidoglio at the, the Capitoline Hill in Rome. Um, three different buildings by, uh, by Palladio, again, another um, sort of uh, icon, uh, um, important figure in, classical, in the classical tradition. Um, Borromini, um, uh, a Baroque architect uh, in Rome. Uh, moving to the United States, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who uh, designed uh, the, the rotunda and the lawn at the University of Virginia. Uh, McKim, Mead, and White, a great 19th and early 20th century architectural firm in New York, uh, who did the building on the lower left that, that uh, essentially uh, was the building that is at the opposite end of Jefferson's rotunda. Um, uh, a, an example from our own day, uh, Leon Creer, who was the first winner of the Driehaus Award that was offered last year. And you know, there's a hundred year separation between McKim, Mead, and White and Leon Creer, and there are all kinds of other examples that I could have shown. But um, just to give you an idea, that it's not all—it's—it's um, uh, it's not 
obviously there are more people, more great classical and traditional architects from the past, but it's a, it's a living tradition and there are people that we, you know, whose work we, we look at today. Um, but the models of excellence are not only uh, individual works of architecture, they're not only individual architects, um, they're also cities, right? So Chicago uh, is a model of excellence for, for us uh, in thinking about urban environments. Um, it's not just big cities, it's, it's smaller cities. So Bruges uh, would be another. And it's not just European cities, but also American cities, so, or American small towns, Skinny Atlas, New York. I have a student here from Skinny Atlas, New York. And uh, uh, she's, uh, she, she sees all these pictures of her hometown that, uh, that I show periodically. Um, and then uh, uh, these towns are not just creations of the past, but Seaside, Florida uh, is, a, is a model of excellence. And Seaside, Florida uh, is, uh, uh, is in the, uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida and is, only, uh, is less than 25 years old. Um, the fellow teachers are not, uh, you know, are not just architects, but also um, the whole intellectual and artistic uh, tradition uh, of Western of Western civilization to the extent that we are able to um, actually take their ideas uh, their ideas seriously, um, so that um, uh, you know here we have uh, as fellow teachers uh, Plato and Aristotle and Raphael who uh, brought them together in the, in the, as the central figures of his painting uh, the School of Athens. Jan and Hubert van Eyck uh, and their uh, uh, the Ghent altarpiece and their depiction of of paradise uh, as a city and a garden, uh, derived uh, very much from the skyline of Ghent, um, which is where, where they, they were working. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, <laughs> Vitruvius and Alberti and Aquinas and Tocqueville and Philip Reef and Colin Rowe, Alistair McIntyre, and of course, not least, uh, Nietzsche uh, and Gilbert, Gilbert Chesterton. Um, so I'm very quickly, I'm almost done. Uh, I'm very quickly just going to show you some examples of student work uh, from Notre Dame. Um, uh, the work that I'm going to show is both undergraduate work and graduate work. Um, as I said, the program that we're starting up is an expansion of the graduate program. Um, and so I've organized these not really so much according to um, uh, what year they took place, but sort of where in the program, whether they're beginning exercises, introductory exercises, intermediate exercises, or um, uh, terminal design or thesis, thesis projects. So um, here's an introductory exercise uh, in drawing techniques and conventions. They draw uh, an existing building, in this case, Rockney Hall uh, here on campus. Um, a, uh, uh, an early kind of uh, design exercise that they do called an analytique, where they look at different parts of a, of a particular building and its, uh, its classical elements and, and compose them. And, um, an introductory uh, design exercise, an introductory design studio uh, for a townhouse, a relatively simple uh, building, uh, building program. Uh, an introductory exercise where they are uh, uh, you know, doing work uh, designing uh, buildings in space, not only the interior spaces of the building, but they're looking at, um, at um, uh, compositions of buildings together to help, uh, to help shape exterior space as well. Um, an exercise in looking at the, again, the relationship between architecture and construction, where the drawings show not only the spatial features of the building, but also, um, also the way that the building is made. Uh, urban design is the central uh, part of the program in, in this project. The site in Chicago is on the left, and on the right uh, is the, the, um, uh, the urban design, uh, what, what architects like to call the, the intervention, um, but the, the proposal for the site which then also provides uh, opportunities for the class further uh, along in the semester to, they, they pick a site that they've designed in the urban plan and they design a building for it, and these are examples of that. Um, the undergraduate students in their fourth year uh, have an opportunity to do a, a, an urban high-rise building. Uh, we have an excellent um, shop person who's um, um, thoroughly versed in uh, fine uh, classical uh, furniture uh, and gets uh, unbelievable work um, out of, the, uh, out of the, the, the furniture courses that he teaches. Um, urban design, uh, again, is a, a central part of the, um, uh, of the curriculum. Um, 
Um, and then these are all uh, examples of uh, thesis or terminal uh, design projects um, that students do during their, the final semester. Uh, and not all of them turn out to be classical. They're, they're, um, uh, the basic foundation of their education is classical, but by the time they get to um, their, um, uh, their final terminal design project, they are uh, uh, exploring any, any number of different things. So um, uh, usually it comes up, or often it comes up, as a kind of traditional uh, building um, uh, or, or composite, um, compilation of buildings um, done in some regional um, or local, uh, local vocabulary. Um, and then this last project is a, is a counter proposal uh, by a, a, a grad student who just graduated last spring. Uh, it was a counter proposal for the new cathedral in uh, Oakland, California. This was his uh, proposed alternative to what, what is actually going to be built there. Now, let me conclude with the thought that among the merits of the Catholic intellectual tradition, for the practice of architecture and urban design um, are that it allows us to argue in good faith uh, for why traditional urbanism and the architecture of which uh, traditional cities are, uh, is made are genuine human goods. The tradition likewise draws us away from any dehumanizing determinist temptations by its dogged insistence that character is the key to civilization not only in terms of social justice and human happiness, but also in terms of artistic creation. It allows those of us who are architects and urban designers to steer ourselves away from sterile notions of the zeitgeist, self-expression, and novelty for its own sake in favor of the fecund language of craftsmanship and moral, intellectual, and artistic excellence. It even allows us to maintain in good faith that our efforts to make beautiful things are not futile that the arts we offer up to God are rewarded with the beauty that is constantly giving itself back to us. Cities are the means that human beings have made uh, in order to live well, and the city itself is also an aesthetic object. Beautiful cities support human flourishing, but beautiful cities are themselves a sign of human flourishing. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, I didn't mean to go this long, um, but I can, I can take questions. Yeah, Stephen. I, yeah, I obviously appreciate very much what you're trying to do here. I, I just wonder about whether, practically speaking, the city properly designed, like the trans, you know, based upon say a transect model, is it just a question of, of an aid towards human? perfection or, an, or, or, or taking away impediments from human perfection. I've lived in cities like Berkeley, which followed the Transdeck model. Um, I don't think that people are any more virtuous there. Right. Uh, in Vicenza or, you know, anywhere. It is, are you just trying to create what? a ground so that it, so there's a potential for flourishing? Or? Well, yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, again, the the environments, I mean, any, any, uh, any town or city or neighborhood that was built before 1945 uh, uh, will be, it's possible to examine its physical structure and see its resemblance to the transect. And it was built this way without anybody ever formulating the idea of the transect or codifying it in, in any way, because it was just the cultural habit. It's the way that we did things, and it was dictated by the fact that uh, that, that uh, you know, we've been doing this for 2,000 years or 5,000 years or whatever because it was dictated by uh, the, the, the walking, you know, our nature as walking human beings and how far it is comfortable to walk. And so um, the idea of the transect, I mean, what, you know, the problem is that after the Second World War, we created zoning ordinances that make it illegal to make these traditional kinds of environments. And so the objective of identifying the transect as a tool and using it as the basis for zoning is simply to remove the legal impediment uh, that, that uh, you know, to, to making um, good 
uh, neighborhoods and good towns. It's not the case that these are going to automatically follow. It's simply that, in other words, the, 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 the transect is a necessary, in today's culture, the argument is that the transect is a necessary condition for good neighborhoods. It's not a sufficient condition. So, Nicole. It's, um, I would say that that's a, um, that's a characterization of what um, the urbanists are attempting to do that um, is not um, an accurate characterization across the board. In other words, the, when, when new urbanists do a project and they, they make a code uh, or propose a code so that the, the master plan can be realized, um, the codes themselves uh, may be more prescriptive and they may be less prescriptive. Um, uh, and that just varies from place to place. I think it, it depends upon, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of these projects uh, or proposals come out of a charrette process um, that it's really under the control of a developer. Uh, and, and so the developer may decide that he wants stricter standards, he or she wants stricter standards. Um, and it's their prerogative as developers to do that. Where I think it becomes controversial is when uh, there's some kind of an overlay district, zoning district, that's proposed for an existing neighborhood and where aesthetic regulations are put into effect. The kind of, uh, zone or the kind of um, zoning code that I showed um, actually uh, had very minimal, it had no aesthetic regulations uh, per se. Um, it illustrated uh, the building types um, and it illustrated uh, where buildings, uh, it illustrated four things. How tall the building could be in terms of stories, minimum and maximum number of stories. It illustrated um, where the building uh, had to be located with regard to its footprint on the site, where it had to be located relative to the lot lines. It indicated where the parking, uh, the off-street parking had to go, whether there was any that was required. And it indicates um, the kinds of uses that are permitted. But generally what that means is whether there are any uses that are strictly uh, forbidden because, uh, again, the premise is that a mix of uses is desirable and that uses will change over time. So that's a very minimal kind of, I mean, there's nothing about colors, there's nothing about shutters, there's nothing about slopes of roofs or, or anything like that. There's some codes where, you know, where they try to um, uh, enforce that. My sense is that that's, it probably works better to enforce that in, on greenfield sites where there's a developer who's developing everything from scratch than it is to try to enforce it in an existing neighborhood. And I, I think, um, you know, some new urbanists have, you know, more, uh, more ambitious plans for how other people should live than others. I, I think a lot of new urbanists simply like uh, um, traditional neighborhoods and are looking for ways to make it possible to make them that they're, you know, um, that they're currently forbidden to do. So it's, uh, it, it varies quite a bit, but yes, it is a, it's an issue, obviously. So, Randy. Pictures, <laughs> um, the, the, as we propose them, the pictures don't have any legal status. They are definitely employed. You know, we try to find good examples to illustrate the type, so that people will be encouraged to make buildings that at least achieve 
the, the standard of the image, if not surpass it. Ideally, it would surpass it. But, but um, yeah, there's nothing, um, you know, the, the, the question of how, it's, it's always a question of when you get a master plan that uh, develops a positive vision for a development. Uh, it's always the question of how do you get from that vision to it's actually being built and not being built badly and not being dumbed down. And some, uh, uh, you know, new urbanist town planners and their developers uh, go to great lengths to try to uh, code everything. Uh, but others have found that the way to do it um, is simply to have um, a town architect. I mean, they, they, well, they, they designate somebody to be on site who's, you know, to live on site, whose responsibility it is to, re to um, um, review all the plans that are submitted for buildings uh, and sign off on them uh, before they're allowed to build. That's what Robert Davis did um, in Seaside, uh, is that he, you know, had a series of town architects uh, in Seaside. And, and there were some general guidelines about, again, where, where buildings were located relative to the site and things like that. Um, and, and in fact, it became a game. If you ever go to Seaside, I know you've been to Seaside, but the, um, the, the game is... Please. For those interested in the tour, the art tour, you will be meeting at the Snipe Museum at 3.40. Once again, the art tour will be meeting at the Snipe Museum at 3.40 promptly. Thank you. Uh, it's been a big game at Seaside, you know, for, for architects to test the limits. I and mean, there's a lot of high design architects who have built at Seaside and, and, and tried to stretch the code. Uh, and what it showed is the code actually has a lot of flexibility. So, yes? I'm sorry, could you just speculate uh, for a minute? How many years do you think South Bend, Indiana is from joining the list of, you know, Charleston and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me like... Most Notre Dame professors and coaches are all moving gated communities up in Granger. And yeah. Maybe not in the architecture department. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I would I would love for um, uh, I'd, I'd love for graduating architecture students from you know from Notre Dame who um, you know ha have enough means to you know buy or build uh, one house to to start and and you know build one and then build two and then build four. Um, we're actually the School of Architecture has a program through the Downtown Design Center where uh, we're working with the city of South Bend. Um, and in fact, this semester we're we're um, uh, right now actually we're working on a, a project for sort of uh, a proposal to reurbanize the area around uh, Kovaleski Stadium. Um, and you know, I mean, the the, the city of South Bend. Um, uh, they're very supportive of this. They would like to see that happen. I think that the um, what's necessary is for them to get um, some drawings that present a, uh, well, two things. One is to get some drawings that present a positive vision of what can take place there. And then they need to amend their zoning ordinance so that that's legal. Uh, and then they need to, um, there, I have a certain sense that they, that they um, kind of wait for developers. Or maybe they have developers that they work with who are not familiar with, um, with either familiar with or, tr or interested in traditional neighborhood design. And I think maybe the biggest thing that they could do after having a vision and having, uh, you know, changing the zoning ordinance is to sort of aggressively court developers who are interested in traditional neighborhood design because they're out there. I, I, yeah, people have to go. So um, I'll be happy to talk to anybody afterwards. Thank you very much. distinction between a private code and a public code. I mean, the, the new neighborhood, the developers can put all kinds of silly regulations, right. but at least... Yeah.